<laughs> Carson Swalwell, you've seen uh, Speaker Pelosi uh, in, in every version of her job. As a member of the California delegation, you have been in California state delegation meetings with her, which is something that the members from the other states don't get to do, uh, as well as uh, her work as speaker, as an impeachment manager. Obviously, you're in close consultations with the speaker's office. I just want to open the mic to you, uh, Congressman, for your reflections on Madam Speaker tonight. Uh, Lawrence, uh, good evening. Hi, Joy. Uh, there has never hey. been a leader of a legislative branch like Nancy Pelosi, and there never will be again. But we will all be better off because she led, and uh, she also developed and mentored so many of my colleagues to make sure that you know the future is in good hands. Lawrence, one other role that uh, I have served with her uh, in is on the Intelligence Committee, and you know she appointed she the Intelligence Committee is a what, the only committee that's a direct appointment by the Speaker, not the Steering Committee. And she still sits in and receives intelligence briefings. And she proudly was a ranking member of the Intelligence Committee. And, and so we all joke that that committee is her baby. And, and you better show up and do the work on that committee because uh, she checks in on that committee more than any other committee to make sure the members are doing uh, the work. Uh, but I heard about this announcement around 11 o'clock today. I bolted out of the Capitol. I went and got my four-year-old daughter, Cricket, because I wanted her to be in the chamber and, and represent every little girl whose future will be brighter and have more opportunities because Nancy D'Alessandro Pelosi raised her hand and served this great country. Uh, Joy, every day of Congressman Swalwell's daughter's life, uh, a woman has been the leader of the Democrats in the House of Representatives. And as she put it today, she herself never dreamed she would go from homemaker to house speaker. No, absolutely. It, it is such an important point. You know, for my kids, you know, most of their sentient life, Speaker Pelosi has been in charge of the House of Representatives. And, you know, as somebody who grew up uh, with a mother who revered Shirley Chisholm and so revered her as well, you know, I always had the sense that women have the capability for great power and that the House of Representatives has the capability for great power. But for, you know, from high school all the way through sort of early college, it was, you know, the power was somebody named Tip O'Neill. You know, right? It was always a white man. Um, and you even think about the other person that's named as one of the greatest speakers, Sam Rayburn. He was presiding over a Congress that was entirely white men. And so the deals they could cut in back rooms were being cut among people who, whatever their political differences, remember, this was a normal Republican Party back then, their differences were slight compared to the things they had in common. They could go back, smoke a cigar, they had things in common. If you think about Speaker Pelosi, the reason I do believe she will be ranked as the greatest speaker in U.S. history she presided over a caucus that is the most diverse, that increasingly became filled with women, became filled with people of color. The Congressional Black Caucus expanded. The Progressive Caucus expanded under her leadership. And so she had to make deals among people with some like needs and some very unlike needs. She had to manage a caucus that was so diverse and whose interests were so diverse that that juggling act she had to do in those little cute kitten heels that she wore all the time. And I can tell you this because I interviewed her at the Capitol and I was stumbling in my heels and she was clack clackety clacking in hers with not a problem. She was doing a job that no speaker has ever had to pull off, and she pulled it off and got health care. That's a boss. Yeah, and, and Carson Swallow, as we know, she was working with tiny majorities uh, as speaker compared to the kinds of majorities that speakers like Tip O'Neill had. Tip O'Neill could let dozens of Democrats go on a vote uh, from conservative districts saying, don't worry, we don't need your vote. You know, we liberals hit Tip O'Neill from uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts and, and, and his others. We can easily do this without you. Uh, Speaker Pelosi needed just about every Democrat on every vote when she was doing this. And that is that's just a, a, a degree of difficulty that I don't think can be appreciated uh, unless you've really been there. We had a plus four majority of uh, this last Congress and Joe Biden's first two years is regarded as, you know, the most successful two years uh, of a president, you know, at least in the last 50 years. And, and that is in large part because there was no drama in the House. Uh, Nancy Pelosi 
knows her caucus, knows her members' needs, knows what we can do and knows what we can't do. And you're going to see pretty quickly here when Kevin McCarthy has a plus four majority in the House, uh, you know, how hard that is uh, to do. Uh, but, but I also just want to say, you know, about Speaker Pelosi, it, it is unwritten, it's not written enough what she did to build a bench. And the fact that you have three leaders right now who are likely going to, you know, take over uncontested, that is in great deal because she invested her time in developing, enabling them, and mentoring them. And when I came to Congress as a 31-year-old, I had, didn't have much confidence in myself and often wondered if I belonged there. And she sought me out and told me, you belong here. It's your role to lead people of your generation and put me at the leadership table. And I don't think she gets enough credit for what she's done uh, to really make sure that the next generation is indeed uh, in capable hands. And Joy, uh, her work isn't done. We're going to see uh, more of her work on the House floor. She will uh, try to do something with the debt ceiling so that the Republicans won't have that next year uh, to be held hostage. And so we're going to continue to see her work before this year ends. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the 2010 lame duck session was one of the great master classes in congressional leadership. You know, the, the Democrats took a risk. They passed Obamacare with the Tea Party literally issuing death threats and screaming threats and demagoguing it as essentially death panels, right? They knew they were going to take a hit, but Speaker Pelosi was wise enough to figure out how to make that lame duck session one of the greatest periods in legislative history. I have no doubt that she'll be able to do that. And I do have to concur with the congressman. Passing the torch in the way that she did and in the way that she got Steny Hoyer and obviously Jim Clyburn to collectively pass the torch to this next generation to essentially say, I'm going to recast the party that was already diverse with Clyburn there, which was an incredible opportunity for an African-American man in this country's history. But to then say it's going to be a, a, a woman, a white woman, it's going to be a Latino man. And then the, the, the successor to Speaker Pelosi is going to be Hakeem Jeffries, an, an African-American man with the country the way it is right now, struggling with just dealing with these ideas of being a diverse democracy. This is how you lead. And so I think that people need to appreciate Speaker Pelosi for her class, for her incredible outgoing speech today. What an amazing career just for little girls and little boys to understand this is how you lead. This is how you lead, and this is how, with great class, you exit stage left.